which in turn can lead to a better efficiency and outcome for us within the organization. I will talk through some new data and insights, I think, which uh, really need to shape why we are talking about this topic and help rethink some of our assumptions that we carry through. We are going to look at uh, some specific elements of uh, just bear with me and there seems to be some issue with the right we're going to be talking about uh, specifically on the quality hire element and the dynamics between the ability and fit and uh, maybe actually question some of the work that we do today as uh, recruiting organizations. And also perhaps uh, focus on areas that we need to change. And so balance that uh, difference between the ability and the fit uh, component in the new dynamic that, that we need to take into account as we look at uh, the way we move in these organizations. We'd also look at uh, what the best in-class organizations do around this and um, or talk through some key imperatives uh, that are, in my view, critical for us to bear in mind even as we build a better talent uh, selection process. And what I'd really like you to do is to ask questions because that's when the power of what we would have uh, is essentially leveraged and we, as was mentioned, we would have certain polling questions which allows us to tap into the general thinking that is uh, prevalent among the audience which of course can be very enriching. So what I'd like to do is to go on to the first polling question. If I may request you to, based on your understanding of the landscape of the volume recruitment, what in your view has changed over the last seven years? Do you think the change has not been significant? There is some change or you think there is a radical shift or you're unsure? We'll give you We are closing the poll right now. Right. Um, that is very, very clearly telling, and I think. Uh, we are completely in sync with the response. There is a significant percentage of uh, the total audience who have indicated there is a radical shift in the way volume recruitment has changed over the last seven years. And uh, for those of us who think that it has not changed at all, uh, clearly we, uh, we, we possibly are living in uh, a uh, space uh, where uh, we perhaps have been absolutely untouched by the environment. And for those of us who think there is uh, some change, uh, you are being pulled in by the various uh, dynamic in the environment that you are ex exposed to. And for most of us, uh, there is a significant change in the entire volume recruitment space. And that's clearly what we would like to uh, leverage uh, even as we go in into these sessions. And what we'd like to do is to, before we get in into the meat of the session, maybe do the second poll. In the backdrop of the changing environment uh, that we are operating in, in today, 
The question is, how confident are you in the level of the candidate quality in your talent pipeline? And the options that you have are you're extremely confident, you're confident, you're somewhat confident, or you're not at all confident. And here is again an opportunity for you to exercise your uh, vote and indicate the level of confidence that you think you have with regards to the quality of candidates in your talent pipeline. Ten seconds more. We will be closing the polls now. Right, here again, very, very um, interesting. Um, so what you saw earlier on was that there is a radical shift in the way we are seeing the environment changing. And what you see here is the level of confidence that seems to be absolutely in sync with the, uh, the changes that are dynamic, and that seems to be significantly enhanced. So the overall sense of confidence is very, very high. And in the backdrop of what we said, that the entire recruitment uh, landscape has significantly changed. It becomes important for one to be able to recognize the drivers that are leading to this and how do we manage this is very, very important. So in that backdrop, what I'd like to do is to uh, link up and set up that context in the new work environment that we are operating in and uh, where there is a significant enhancement in the higher volume of applications. So what's really driving some of these three trends and changes in the world of recruiters is essentially the uh, seen across uh, various organizations around the world. So over the last decade, technology has virtually demolished the entire barriers that candidates seem to face when it comes to applying for jobs. And you do find that there is a significant impact on the rate at which individuals seem to be applying over for the jobs every passing year. Because of this, the ease of access and applicants seem to be able to put their application in front of more than more employers than ever before. And in fact, one out of four candidates that are actively seeking jobs are actually going out to 10 or more organizations during their job search. Now, this is really very interesting. And in many cases, it's so easy that with a single click, you recognize a person can apply to multiple jobs with that one click of a button. Therefore, more candidates are applying to more jobs as it is easier for them to access them on the one hand. And the net increase in terms of the obvious conclusion here is that the application volume is going up. And as you look at the data over the past three years, we've seen applicants' volumes rise by 33%. So much more applicants. And this is a great problem we have, right? But unfortunately, access isn't exclusive to top talent. The increase in applicants doesn't mean that you're going to have higher percentage of highly qualified applicants in your applicant pool. In fact, because it is so easy to apply, we see that percentage of highly qualified applicants for any volume posting are actually getting smaller. You know, when you look at the number here, nearly over two-thirds of the applicants in any volume position are considered lower or average quality applicants. So we can talk about the cost of this at a different point of time, but speculating the why not, if it is so easy to apply, why would I take a shot? Maybe that the candidates are looking to hit the employment lottery. Nothing to lose, really, by having such an easy access of applying. Just going to summarize uh, the background here. So the technology has had a great benefit in terms of the access to the top of the final numbers. 
and um, you possibly will have uh, will have a situation where you're looking at a needle in a haystack, and that's what uh, always uh, has been the issue in terms of finding top talent. Now, essentially, it's the same number of needles that we are having more haystacks and uh, bigger haystacks, perhaps, to look through. So you really have a challenge in terms of being able to identify just that top talent that you're buying for, and uh, that's not easy to come by. So with all the aid of technology, you still are finding yourself falling short. Now, everybody knows that it's easier to apply, right? The volumes are going up. So in response to the situation, the organizations are just throwing more resources at the recruiting functions. And I probably think I can hear the audience right now would be groaning potentially at the, at least ironically laughing. But this isn't the case. Recruiting te teams are stretched. To give you some data here, very few organizations are throwing more money and investing more money in the recruitment function. So we are not, not getting enough headcount and additional resources to help with the increased volume. Only a quarter of the, uh, of the companies are increasing their budget for the recruitment function. When you look at it and break it down, there are actually more organizations either decreasing budget or keeping it the same. So this is the age old, we have to do more with less principle. The demand is, things are getting more challenging, and we have more to do, but we are not going to get additional resources. The cavalry is not coming. So it, it's actually leaving for recruiters doing more with less is really a challenge. Now to couple that, so since we are not getting more resources and recruiting functions and not having more headcount, as a result, you have to serve more business units. So you look at the change here from 2011 to 2012 of recruiting functions, how many business units they are serving. You know, they have changed from 6.9 to 9.3. So what does that tell you? You, it, it tells you that you're essentially having to support more areas of business now than what you did a year ago. And this is, again, legacy data, but nevertheless indicative of what you would experience, and perhaps it becomes even more complex in today's context. Looking at the number of hiring managers that an individual is serving per recruiter, same time period went from 18 hiring managers to 22 on an average. So in short, the pressure is building for recruiters and the option you are left with is spending less time on each applicant or what I will argue here is to take that approach and I will take a moment to discuss some of the factors that are really going to be critical from a selection decision point that we are making. So what I'd like to do is to focus on the key recruiting challenges affecting a corporate performance. You're essentially looking at only 25% of the hiring managers who report that the recruiting function influences their selection decisions. Now, what a dismal display that is. And you have the new higher turnover rate is 7% higher compared to all employee turnover. And that, again, is a compelling piece of, of evidence. Now, what does that mean? People are coming in into the organization, but they are not necessarily delivering the expectations of the organization. And that is clearly a cause for concern. And you find 20% of new hires are considered that position, 20%. And only 35% of hiring managers are satisfied with uh, the recruiter's impact. We really have a situation here uh, that calls for uh, serious introspection and cost correction. So in that context, what I'd like to do is to talk about defining the quality of hiring. And what I'd like to focus on here particularly is to, to understand what is it that you're looking for. 
and that understanding in turn should necessarily help us to be able to have a clarity with regards to where are we investing our time and effort in. So the question is, what has a bigger impact on the quality of hire? Is that ability, which is, as we know, the knowledge, uh, the skills that are fundamental for effectiveness of the job? Or is that to do with the fit, which is essentially the new hire relationship with colleagues and the organization that the individual is operating with? And that's a very, very critical question that we need to ask ourselves. And perhaps this is an opportunity for us to go in into Paul here again. And what I'd like us to look at is what is if that impacts the quality of hire more? Is that ability or is it fit in your view? Okay, this should not be so difficult, so we will close this uh, to another 10 seconds. Okay, we're going to close the poll. And even as the results come in, and very interesting, now the result seems to indicate that ability and fit are perhaps almost equally important. And you have 45% who have said that it is to do with ability and 55% who said it is to do with fit. Very, very spot on. So, If I can move on to share with you how we experienced just having some technical glitches here, please bear with us. Sorry about that. Um, you know, the best of preparation seems to sort of go awry at times. So here's what we found in terms of uh, the our research uh, based on the selection effectiveness diagnostic survey that was carried out. It's really not just ability; it's fit as well. And uh, your your poll is absolutely bang on. So the focus here is that there are two types of new hire qualifications as we break it down. It wasn't quite attitude as the audience would say. We're going to be asking that uh, question. But it's, it's, it's an even split as, as we found out between the ability impact on the quality of hire and fit. And really it's important to know that they are equally important. And what I will talk about in next is how are we really seeing that in the way we are evaluating our talent. So because now we are um, in a position to look at ability and fit as both being equally contributing to the overall quality of hire, hopefully we are spending equal time on those when it comes to evaluation. And that's potentially a summise that most of us would have. But unfortunately, it may not be surprising when you look at it that the way we are looking at resumes or the way we are looking at interviews and where to look at the content of, of what you are scanning for, you perhaps will find that uh, what you're actually measuring 
or evaluating in these instances are actually to do with ability. So what we are saying is that there are a number of instances where uh, the selection process becomes focused on ability rather than on the fit. Three-fourths of the people who make it through the process are really strong in areas that we would potentially classify as ability. So that is to say that they have the prerequisite knowledge, skills, and experience that is required to perform the job task. Where we see the problem is that 35% of the hiring are high in fit. So to me, clearly, this reflects that we are seen as what you would expect typically in section programs. So for example, if you were to hire a skilled mechanical maintenance person in a production context, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time looking in the selection process with regards to the technical ability of the individual in terms of does the individual know how to troubleshoot uh, when uh, the individual is encountered with a situation with, uh, say, a pump or a displacement pump or the technical requirements of uh, uh, questions and queries that might come in one's way. Uh, or if you were to look at a call center job, you possibly will have a situation where you would say, uh, does the individual fast, uh, fastly type uh, enough? Uh, can you effectively use technology? Or uh, is the individual in a position to be able to speak clearly on the phone? And these tend to be really the focus areas. And these are then what you evaluate and you focus on uh, the traditional programs that tend to emphasize these. So if fit is important, then we are clearly underemphasizing it to treat that as an opportunity to improve. So the next question is, how do we know what is fit? We need to find an answer in terms of what really do we mean by fit. Critical understand what we are looking for. So we will start breaking that down. And when we think about fit, most people have their own definition and what it means to be a good fit. When I say that fit drives performance, I'm talking about very specific fit. So let me break this down in, into a little more detail and talk about the first aspect of who you are fitting with. Who do you need to fit with? Or what do you need to fit into? Really, the divide here is very clear. It's not just the organization, which is somewhat important. But the biggest impact of what drives overall performance is that extent someone fits in with their immediate context in terms of colleagues, in terms of individuals, their peers, their managers. So the way that someone works with their peers, their managers, and the people they mostly interact with that is perhaps the most important piece based on research. But that said, then it's really about how someone fits. Because it's not just about being with your immediate colleagues in the way that's uh, impressionable or have the same interests or have the same personality. What we actually see when we look at how people fit with those people, they are immediately surrounded with uh, their immediate colleagues. It's not the traits such as their personality, as we traditionally understand personality as a good personality or a bad personality, or how far is the individual likable or not likable, or the way they get along with their colleagues. The how part of the equation with their immediate colleagues is more related to the types having similar competencies and work styles and work preferences. So if you think about someone that is just more a quiet introvert and a noisy extrovert, they may not gravitate towards uh, you know, each other socially. But if they have the same job-related competencies, they can both be high performers in the same job. And that's a classical case of uh, you know, how we traditionally look at a salesperson as someone who tends to be effective in a, uh, as an extrovert versus uh, an ambivert. 
and you potentially will see that uh, we tend to gravitate more towards an extrovert, whereas uh, we have sufficient body of uh, information and research which tells us that perhaps an ambivert is uh, equally effective in a sales role and sometimes even better. And this really is a critical distinction when it comes to designing not only the selection or the assessment program, but the selection for the strategy on the whole. You do hear a lot of clients that uh, you know one works with in the market looking to create some kind of an assessment for an identification system which helps them find more candidates that have the same personalities as what the high performers have. So you want to ensure that you use the, a way to index, if you will, their current high performance traits and uh, just have, have the personality characteristics and use that to find more like those high performers. In practice, that will basically provide you with more people that get along on their job and are more happy when they are together. But it's not necessarily going to mean that they're going to perform better on the job. So that isn't to say that personality isn't important, don't get me wrong. But it's really critical as you think about the fit. It's fit in terms of having similar or having same types of competencies that either complement or consistent with each in the same types of workplace preference. Not the social factors or personality factors. So let's define who you need to be fit with, the immediate colleagues and the types of competencies related to work. So when you look at the fit, you can define for if you are to be or manage to be able to identify the candidates that you consider high in fit, what we call as network fit and what returns we have for this. So I'd like to examine the impact of selecting three different types of fit on performance. So you see some of the serious differences in returns as well. Starting with the culture fit, if someone were to align to the organizational culture and values, you will see clearly some returns from that culture fit. What we have seen in our research is that 12% maximum impact on the overall quality of hire. But that's a good list. But when you look at the network fit, so that's with the immediate colleagues on competencies and preferences that are related to work, you're going to see a bigger return in the neighborhood of 30% impact on the overall quality of hire. So that's determining what type of fit did you look for. Really the story is clear. And it's not to say that the organization is not worth a while endeavor to find people that fit the organization's culture. Again, don't get me wrong. But the import here is to be able to look at job-related or network-related fit components because these really are going to provide us returns when it comes to the overall productivity. And uh, as I'll show you in a moment, the overall ability to reduce turnover. So some specific examples, because employers with network fit and improve the performance of other employers in the network, you really start to see a snowball effect in terms of profitability and turnover when it comes to network segment and returns that you get from hiring people that are high on this. So if you look at the impact of profitability of hiring people are a bit high on that. The average here you see is 16 million US dollars was the average for Fortune 500 organizations per year. And I just faced some questions on the calculations but it's really built up on what we examined through our detailed research built up. And we're looking at the average profitability differences we see from the business unit that is lacking for this network fit or the job related specific competencies compared to those that don't. So that improvement we see for the business unit building that up and using the average Fortune 500 companies 
increment uh, revenues. And besides those, these are the projections that you are likely to be right on in the middle of the Fortune 500 organizations. Similarly, it does not, it, it does have a very big difference when it comes to turnover. So in terms of the actual numbers here, you can see that the alteration of the above for Fortune 500 organizations that have uh, US dollar 850,000 a year and simply reducing their rework costs that are associated with turnover by selecting for this fit component. So now that's basic in the build-up in the reduction of 65% is simply selecting for network fit or having incorporated lift in the selection process. What is the takeaway? The takeaway here is that the real value that these data are rigorously researched and having that network fit confidence in there can provide not only the top line in performance gain, but also pro pro provide for reducing the cost in a significant manner, which in turn limits rework for your recruitment function. So to give specifics, my advice really goes down if you really want to make your recruitment process more efficient, the focus on time of any human extending effort in the recruitment process on those activities that actually require human interaction is to necessarily go down. Your human capital time is the most expensive part of uh, any recruitment process, as you will agree with me. So you need to make sure that when you have someone expending efforts that are focusing their effort on high value activities, you really need to look at that closely. So as recruiters, if you are assessing for both ability and fit, as we talked about, you will wait less time sifting through those unsuitable candidates. If you're spending an entire day looking at resumes, you're probably looking at ability and definitely not fit. So you can't really tell much about either of those by just looking at a resume. And it's not the best use of our human resources time. So focus that time on truly measuring what are the salient elements of ability and fit, and then transition into automating those other value activities is the first step or summarization of how to increase the hiring effectiveness. And to take action on this, the best way that I have seen to work is to do this to empower the recruitment function, which is the first thing in strategically aligning the hiring process and then building it the way that you do in automating all those manual elements and the administrative elements that you are engaged in, which consumes a significant amount of your time. And by integrating an objective assessment, looking at the fit and ability, you are lessening the burden on those administrative activities. So what we have seen, and I will show in a while, some of the specific gains that organization has seen in terms of recruiter efficiency, and we have provided up to 50% gains or more by having some of the automate systems that we have put in place. And that uh, brings us to perhaps the next poll question. The question is, of these four activities, what has the biggest impact on identifying people with network fit? In terms of defining needs, attracting, assessing, or onboarding. What do you think?
Okay, we're going to close the poll in another few seconds. Okay, we're going to close it now. Right, so interesting that we have a substantive percentage, 41% of individuals who seem to indicate that uh, assessing is the most important aspect that has the biggest impact in identifying people with network fit. And that's closely followed by 35% who say that defining needs uh, are the most important. And of course, you have the rest who are taking a pick between attracting and onboarding. And that again, you know, directionally is absolutely on track. And so what I'd like to cover is to see which activities within the recruitment process will have the maximum impact, and you are absolutely right. So what you may think as is the attraction strategy that a lot of organizations are going to go through is allowing the candidate to make the decision as to where they would be a good fit. But what we see is the biggest block in terms of measuring and quantifying an applicant's fit is with the assessment piece. So you can't even do the assessment unless you have done the defining piece in terms of having a clear understanding in terms of what is it that you need to be looking for. Because, so in terms of spending that time to find what exactly the network fit components for the job are, it's important for you to assess and select people. So if you are relying on the onboarding for assessing to impact network fit, then it's too late. And the attraction strategy, self-selection strategy, that we are relying on candidates to decide for themselves can help a little bit in terms of their fit. But that's not going to provide the most gains in terms of identifying the fit. So it, it becomes then important for one to ensure that one is investing sufficient time in terms of defining the key needs that are critical for you to assess, and then going about assessing those elements in terms of integrating in your assessment process the network fit elements such that your assessment then yields the benefits that you're looking for. So what I'd like to do is to share with you a case study of what the best companies do, and uh, we'll leave you with some tangible mechanisms that were adopted by some best-in-class organizations. And this has specific reference to one of our clients in the US, the Time Warner Cable. The overall case is that the organization had inefficient and ineffective talent selection processes. And they really wanted to make that more efficient. There was a lot of manual effort involved and really felt that they could do a lot better and be a lot more effective. And there were certain critical client-facing roles where they, the employee turnover challenges were significant. And, and those were the, the two key areas that they wanted to tackle. So to get to the solution, the step that we took to, was to design a new process that incorporated assessments early in the hiring process. And we went from the ground up to identify what are the critical competencies, the competence and skills and abilities that someone needs to have, as well as the fit elements. And what are the overall behavioral competencies, the work style, and make sure that someone has a good network fit. And this with immediate colleagues that they are working with. So we designed that solution to measure those components and automated it into their integrated technology systems. 
And what this really did was uh, automated some of the selection decisions using that objective data without involving a recruiter or a hiring manager to sift through mountains of data and applications and resumes to window them down to those final few or to shortlist the potential employees. Now the results here are quite impressive and anywhere up to 50% uh, in some cases where we saw a clear improvement to the efficiency gains that the organization received in terms of implementing the objective process. And so the clear need here is to think about aligning strategically where you are making your decision point and where you would be automating. So what the Time Water Cable Process Efficiency did was that they wanted, to, uh, they saw that their recruitment staff spend 68% less time in that screening stage. And uh, the screening of the candidates was a big time stock, less time doing that manual activity. In terms of how that works for the business, from a business standpoint, outside of the process, limited efficiency, the staff turnover is used again um, by 16%. So 16% lower turnover for those critical customer services staff that we were targeting. So not only were the recruiters more efficient, they were doing less rework and backfilling people that they hire that don't work out afterwards. And so the productivity gains and efficiency gains within the recruitment functions were definitely realized, as you can see. And more than the efficiencies, it provided an impetus to the overall business performance. Because we were uh, finding the fit components, not only the abilities and the sales skills of the customer service skills. So what we see is the net gains in the sales performance for the new hires, for the new hires that scored in the top quartile on the assessment scores of 21% more units per month, which is close to 30,000 US dollars per person per year. And those are real gains. In addition, the sales performance, we also saw a higher quality score because we, we found that they have better abilities and fit with the role and they are better at solving the customer's problems. So again, in those top quarter assessments, the new hires that were in the assessment were better in troubleshooting, and that resulted in fewer services, which is a visit that, as you can uh, envisage, that they would have to send someone to someone's home and do some installation work, and so on and so forth. And the next savings per employee in that top scoring category was over 13,000 US dollars per employee per year. So to summarize, these are efficiency and effectiveness gains of, from thinking strategically and aligning your recruitment process or the selection process in terms of what you're looking for and implementing those automated and efficiency tools uh, that can bring about. The cost savings things and the time savings along with just the ability to uh, for applicants have clearly been increased. Now you can actually get to all these applicants more than just looking at a couple of seconds at some resumes and not really giving it a full consideration of the benefits uh, that accrue or significantly higher. So with those, I know that we have some questions coming through, but uh, let me very quickly walk you through the top tips that we would like to highlight for you in terms of managing your talent selection process. So to really boil it down in terms of the key takeaways, what is it that we are saying? Focus on measuring what matters. So think about what you are assessing, whether that's relevant or not. Are you integrating those elements of fit, the network fit that we talked about? So make sure what matters and make sure that everything that you're evaluating at every step in the process is actually the right thing to look for and that you're using the best method for evaluating that. The second element is 
visa to drive out a while. So again, you are not testing or interviewing or doing any of those activities just for the sake of it. You really prioritize everything that you're doing so that you are identifying those traits, those abilities, those fit aspects that are uh, the biggest drivers for performance of turnover. So there are certain competencies or work styles that people have that lead to turnover that's a good thing to focus on. So, you know, am I really driving ROI? Next is to engage candidates. Now, it may sound like we are living in a very employer-centric uh, uh, view of the uh, world where we just get rid of people who don't meet our expectations, uh, who are not suitable for our organization. But having a job relevant, engaging, and act is uh, actually perceived by candidates as uh, very, very engaging. And it leaves a significant impact. An assessment process that is job related, a selection process that is job embedded, which uh, really focuses on taking the individual through a rigorous view of his capabilities, but assessing for the fit elements uh, uh, clearly and communicating this in a consistent manner with the individual clearly enhances the overall effectiveness. The next is, and of course this is uh, uh, clearly something that you would be interested in, the need to work for you or work with you and not against you. I say this, if it's not testing or selecting or interviewing just for the sake of that activity, it, it, all, it all needs to be purposeful, especially with assessments. It needs to provide data that makes you help take decisions and not impair you. And of course, you need to embed the entire program. The process uh, is to ensure that you make this as a, an integral part of what you are doing and enhance the sensibility in terms of relying on the rims, uh, not to rely on the rims of inexperienced hiring managers and select your talent using something that's standardized and inconsistent to evaluate those job of knowledge, skills, and abilities and fit will make the process more objective and really help your organization comply with more professionals and regulate the standards which will then become the key. So with that, um, so that brings me to the end of this presentation and open up for any questions that we have. If we do, um, we will send the top tips and the slide deck uh, in an email. Um, and we have um, a question around we have layoffs. When layoffs are happening across multiple sectors like IT, e-commerce, startups, telecom, what do you think should be the key focus areas for recruiters when they are uh, um, under tremendous uh, pressure of hiring. Um, again, thanks for that question. It's extremely important for you to uh, recognize uh, that you inbuild a highly tech-enabled process, which will select, which will help you sift out candidates who don't necessarily meet the cut, and select in candidates who have the wherewithal from a perspective of fitment, and ensure that you are bringing those individuals who have a fit forward. Um, the next question is, how do we engage employees from the offer to join? Um, that's a very important question. In fact, we have a significant amount of research that uh, we can share with you around it. And it is, uh, it is of enormous value for you, for you to tap in into this. The key piece here is for you to ensure that you engage with the candidates in a consistent basis through the entire journey. And even as you're walking through that journey with the individual, you provide opportunities for the individual to uh, dialogue with. And we have a fantastic product called Precise Fit, uh, which is uh, a cutting edge um, off the sh uh, shelf model, uh, which can be customized to your specific requirement, which actually allows you to guide the uh, entire uh, potential talent pool on the entire selection process on the one hand, and also to engage the participant by providing an overview of the uh, process, how the individual is doing, is progressing, does the individual have the wherewithal 
the uh, to, to have a glimpse of the individual's capability from uh, a realistic job preview and then help the individual to self-select either to progress the the uh, candidature further or to announce the candidature and so on. Uh, which assessment activity will be on the first priority uh, for a startup uh, or a relaunch uh, company? Uh, well, thanks very much for that question. I think the answer is something that was uh, alluded to. It's very important for you to look at the both the elements of ability and uh, fitment. It's important for you to ensure that you have individuals who have the requisite capabilities. That's your threshold because that will be a clear premium in terms of uh, the cognitive ability to allow the engine to couple forward. That having said, you need to ensure that you also look equally on the fit. And without the fit, you probably will have a group of highly cognitively able individuals but who are not necessarily uh, have the wherewithal from a culture uh, and from a fitness standpoint. What should recruiters do when the majority of the applicants are average or below average? When the applicants are good fit in terms of long-term employees? Again, very good question. Thanks for that. I think the key is for us to ensure that we set our benchmarks right. I would, I would be very wary of any organization that is uh, uh, that takes the shortcut to uh, allow for uh, individuals who are perhaps not meeting the bar, who do not meet the cut, to be injected into the organization just because you have a pressure to have, for want of a better word, a bum on the seat. It perhaps is not a good idea. It's not going to help you in the long run. So it's very important for one to be able to take that call. And it's a considered call. You need to, of course, you can't possibly bring people from Mars. You need to see what you're perhaps doing which is working well, what you're perhaps doing which is not working well, and therefore the need for you to try and find that uh, effective balance. And definitely reach out to uh, CEB uh, and we will be in a position to help support you in that process. Uh, which are the areas to be considered to assess the network fit Again, thanks for that question. It's a, it's a very important piece. There are key components that uh, are critical. One is in terms of uh, how far is the individual in a position to be able to be part of the network? Is the individual in a position to uh, integrate himself or herself with the critical stakeholders? How far is the individual in a position to be able to, at a more senior level, build the network or energize the network? Uh, create those interdependencies and being in a position to be able to involve and engage with others and enable the network to perform in a higher realm. And again, we have a number of uh, data points around this. Please do reach out to us. We'll be happy to support you on this. Um, there's a question around organizations that conduct high volume recruiting should have a centralized sourcing team and a full life cycle team that work together to provide support. This centralized model consists of sourcing experts that spend 100% of their time focusing on sourcing and researching new talent pools. Your views how team structure is critical. Thanks, thanks Vivek, for that question. Um, you've actually, um, in a sense, alluded to the answer. Uh, when you have uh, high volume recruiting that's going on and where you have those uh, teams that are focused on sourcing, from uh, uh, the other aspects of the recruitment process, I think it is, it's, it's a powerful way to leverage uh, scale and ensure that you are uh, focusing on what you are perhaps the best at and you create a sufficient sense of uh, capabilities over time to be nimble enough to manage the changes uh, in the environment and also to ensure that you are on top of the sourcing component, and that in turn allows you to feed in into the overall um, recruitment process. Uh, so to, to simply answer that, I think it's very important for you to look at your structure and you look at every single component within the structure, particularly in the context of what we said that you have recruiters who are uh, largely being supporting a number of businesses, and that is increasing and that will continue to increase. It becomes perhaps very important for one to be able to take an uh, overview 
approach towards having that structure clearly lined out and also in the specific responsibilities of specific individuals within that structure. Thank you, Dr. John. Is it possible to transform the existing employees into network fit and how can this be done? Um, yes, uh, that is a very good question and that is where the entire development uh, element go in. So for you to be able to move that individual from an existing um, or where, where he is and transform or transition the individual into a network fit, you need to do an assessment first to understand what exactly is the individual stand on the network fit, how far is he from the network fit to begin with, and then you go about looking at uh, managing the uh, entire uh, transition to development inputs. Um, with that, I think we have uh, come to the end of our time. Uh, so thank you so very much for your questions. And I do find there are a significant amount of questions that are there. Uh, we'd uh, revert to you with uh, possible responses. And of course, feel free to you know, call or touch base with us and be happy to support you. And thank you so very much for your time this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. John. And on my personal behalf and on behalf of NHRN, I really thank Dr. John for sharing their wonderful thoughts, insights and experience with us. We are indeed grateful to you, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We look forward to your participation in our future program. Thank you.